Sonic Frontiers is a game. What? No matter what you think about it, it has become a landmark title in the series, seeing both a pretty positive critical reception and sales for the first time since 2011's Sonic Generations, as far as Sonic Team's games are concerned. For someone who has been wanting this series to turn around, this news should be good, and it's hard to argue with that. There are positives to find in this game on its own merits, as well as having potential to lean into further ones for the future of the Blue Hedgehog. However, on a personal level, despite others' love for this game, I feel conflicted. Which is strange on my part. Not because I like all the games in this series or typically dislike a large majority of them. My views are often nuanced. Finding things I dislike in the games I thoroughly enjoy or potential I see in those I don't. But at the end of the day, none of that really matters, does it? While there are both objective and subjective reasons, the final conclusion is simple. Do I like the game or not? It doesn't matter if one side outweighs the other. So, it's not simply that there are things I enjoy and don't enjoy within this game. That's always the case. What differs here is after considering both the positives and the negatives. Before now, I could not have given you a straight answer whether I like Sonic Frontiers or not. My feelings toward it just clashed that heavily. With this last playthrough and the research that preceded it, having the distinct goal of identifying and breaking down both all of those feelings that seem at odds, and the game itself, in the hope of finally reaching that conclusion. So, with all that said, let's take a trip together to see exactly what I've discovered along the way. Before talking about the game proper though, we need to go over some important background info to its creation. I've made it no secret that I've hated the current narrative direction of Sonic games for the past couple of years. This isn't a controversial statement by any means. In fact, it's probably the opposite. As previously, Ken Pontak was the narrative head of the series, primarily known for his work on children's cartoons such as Lazy Town, and he brought that type of style to Sonic. I don't want to harp on the guy too much as I've already done that in the past, but the important takeaway is, stories in the series felt very childish, more built around Saturday morning cartoon jokes, and the respect for the past was on the level of reading a Wikipedia summary, as that was literally all the work Pontac self-admittedly put in, leading many to lament for a different writer to take the helm, whether it was Control returning to Japan, or another name that was thrown around quite often, by me admittedly as well was Ian Flynn, the main writer of the Sonic IDW comic run, which surprisingly is who was given his video game debut here, to the joy of many fans. Admittedly not all though, some were still skeptical of the change, which I understand. I've had my own issues with Ian's writing throughout his tenure and not to get ahead of myself, but some of that does rear its head throughout the game. In spite of any misgivings though, it was pretty hard to see this change as anything but good it showed some clear course correction, leading to a lot of goodwill being sent the game's way before it even released. However, before we can discuss if that goodwill was well placed, we have to, perhaps fittingly, look at a comic. <laughs> Sonic Frontiers Prologue Conversions is the true start of the adventure per an annoying trend of the past few games. It's far less egregious than what happened with Sonic Forces, where the entire backstory of the main villain was locked behind its comic, making the game worse for it. Thankfully, in contrast here it's rather simple. The comic opens up with Sonic, Tails, and Amy beating up what seems to be Eggman and another of his mechs, whereas the gang soon finds out his bot is a decoy, merely being a trap to distract the Sonic heroes. In their victory though, we learn that the group is headed to the Starfall Islands due to something or someone that has managed to draw the Chaos Emeralds to the location. Tails further explaining that legend has it that a long lost civilization once lived on this island. Amidst this, the real Eggman is doing his best to beat the heroes to the location, seemingly succeeding in this as the last few pages show us Eggman's point of view, where we see him on the island plotting to use the Ancient's power and technology for his own means with the final shot specifically, leaving us with Eggman using his new invention, an AI, to take down the ancient cybersecurity. Now, obviously a lot of this information is still in the game's opening. It's just 
far worse pace. To me, the situation reads as whoever was in charge wanting to get the player into the action faster, but frankly, I think this makes a far better opener. As is, it just cuts between two scenes in rapid succession that feel almost disconnected. The further context from the comic is nice, making them not feel so disjointed, but I think what we really missed out on is having an action scene with Sonic, Tails, and Amy, fighting together similar in style to the Sonic Unleashed opening. Hell, you could have made the fight a bit of a tutorial for the combat in a similar manner to Chaos Zero in Sonic Adventure. No matter the route taken, I think it would have been a large improvement. And to put it most simply, I believe extended media should be used to, well, extend. In the case of those comics, it feels like an excuse to chop off the opening paragraph of the story, not add additional cross-media content. However, I did say they chopped off this opening to get the player right into the game. And as so many prior entries of the past, we find ourselves being dropped into a familiar location, Green Hill Zone. But not only is it Green Hill Zone, it's also the tutorial stage for Sonic Unleashed. These are cyberspace levels. The narrative reason for this is these stages are from Sonic's memory, but unlike in Sonic Generations where they reimagined these stages, or even in Sonic Forces where they at least made new layouts as middling as they were. This game is content doing the ultimate copy-paste job, where it sticks those old layouts into the assets of Green Hill, Chemical Plant, and Sky Sanctuary from Sonic Generations, with few exceptions. And alright, here's my issue. The two biggest detracting statements when people complain about Green Hill or reused assets are as follows. Firstly, People incorrectly bring up aspects of other games like Wispy Woods from Kirby, coming back in most entries. But with Wispy, he is reimagined, remixed, and a whole host of other rewords that you can think of. They have fun with it. It's interesting to see how he's changed for each entry, on top of being a small part of the first world that you kick the shit out of. And on that note, He's actually not always the first boss either. It's kind of exciting seeing him show up, because you'll never know what they'll do. Further, no one cared when we had an Emerald Hill Zone, and no one is going to care when we have the Green Hill wannabe in Sonic Superstars. It's the fact that they just keep uplifting Green Hill Zone without doing anything interesting with it. That's the lazy part. This brings me to reuse content, which is conceptually not the issue. What truly boggles my mind though, and I think many others, is how they go about it. I love Sonic Generations. To this day, it is a beautiful game. And if it wasn't for Unleashed, it would be the best looking in the series in my opinion. If you want to use these assets again, go for it. But why is it just Green Hill Zone, Chemical Plant, and Sky Sanctuary? Why not use all of these levels, and their variants present in the special challenges? You'd have so much more variety this way. Both the in-universe and meta-logic behind it doesn't even fully make sense. Sonic goes to locations he's never been to, being Shadow's levels. Then when you consider the reasons given for why we have these assets rehashed, there's an outlier. With the game having a city variant that is completely new, and it's my favorite for that reason, even if the enemies are programmed wrong so they can never shoot. I really wish they just went one way or the other, whether it was making four unique looks that could be a fun blend of all the typical Sonic level tropes, or just using all the callback locations from Generations, and perhaps the other modern games thus giving us variety in this one. I think at this point it's fairly evident how sloppy this seems. Regardless of the low IQ Twitter users telling you this stuff isn't an issue, their entire argument about games in general reusing assets continues to fall flat in the way they try to apply it to Frontiers. Games usually bring back assets because they can touch them up, improve, and add on, while giving the developers more time to make other assets, put that work elsewhere where it's needed. It doesn't feel that way with Sonic, in fact, it's backwards. I mean, look at how animated he was in Generations or Lost World. Just about everything is more fluid movement-wise. I am begging Sonic Team to be lazy and reuse more assets. The previous Sonic models even look a million times better, with more detail and longer quills, as well as matching the cutscene model, but no, with forces and continued into this game. They've chosen to replace what we once had with lower quality assets instead of keeping them and using development time to make new levels. 
what Sonic Team chooses to reuse and not reuse from the level geometry, enemies to Sonic himself, doesn't make any sense, and that's why fans get so frustrated. Okay, but how does it play you ask? Well, I can actually give you one answer. I can tell you how my game plays, but there's a decent chance yours plays differently. This isn't a result of mods or anything of the sort. Sonic Frontiers does something, admittedly, interesting. In that, you can tweak Sonic's physics. This used to just affect the overworld. But with Update 2, it was expanded into the cyberspace stages, with momentum sliders. As one of the biggest complaints with the game for months after its release was that it lacked any momentum. Which, at the time, Morio Kishimoto, the game's director, said he would look into it. And to his credit, yeah, he did. What I will say is this game overall does feel a lot better when you actually find that sweet spot. Carrying momentum when you do a sick trick feels natural, especially in the overworld. And to some, I'm sure it's fantastic that you can actually tweak the game. But it doesn't resolve the actual issues. The problem with not designing the game around such an important aspect like momentum is it's not built for it. It feels like a mod. Certain concessions made for the game's original control scheme persist. The player is constantly glued to objects or the inclusion of momentum will break a section's intent. Then when speaking on the overworld once more, some puzzles made me look like a game journalist with how I'd fumble the simplest of movements. Because the game was not designed around Sonic not coming to a screeching halt with every adjustment. Figuring out that sweet spot can be frustrating because of this. And further, while I admit skipping over large portions of a level can be fun at first, as that's the appeal of speedrunning these types of games. It doesn't come from a mastery or understanding of the mechanics. It's probably harder to play Frontiers without flying over all the platforming sections as you achieve it at a simple press of a button. In fact, it's sort of ironic. A normal playthrough can look closer to what one typically imagines a speedrun would be, as opposed to real speedruns of this game, Hey, Sonic. where you sit around fishing. In the end though, even if there was some mystical perfect slider setting that exists, I can't help but feel the way they went about it is flawed. Imagine if every game functioned like this. Would Mario and other well-regarded mascot platformers be talked about as highly if the default physics of the games were missing core features and you had to mess around some in the menus to find something that both fixed that and was remotely fun? Hell, most people probably aren't like you or me and bothered searching through the settings for Frontiers, they most likely just went right into the game using the defaults, as in, no momentum. If the developers took the time to test and create a momentum setting that was more fitting to the game's design themselves, I think I'd be feeling a bit more positive about it. As is, using it or not, each comes with its own benefits and disadvantages, ultimately resulting in poor control at times no matter what you choose. However, there is still an even bigger issue that affects the cyberspace levels specifically, tying back into the very same concept of not connecting the design to the mechanics of the game. Unlike the open zones, these levels weren't built for this game at any point in its development. Whereas with Generations and yes, even Forces, those prior games took these old stages and rebuilt them considering how their engine operated. And you can say, well, ill-fitted or not, these stages are still more fun than Forces levels. And yeah, at their core, you're right. But why would I ever want to play a worse version, as well as a shorter version in most cases, of stages that exist in better Sonic games. Where in their original form, those levels are specifically designed for and built to take advantage of the game's engine and mechanics. Having played them back to back for the sake of footage in this video has only made me feel stronger on this point. It's so clear these stages are not built for this game. They're like a shoddy imitation made in a fan game engine. The one positive I will send the game's way in this regard is in comparison the few stages that do possess original level design, I think are by far the most fun in the game, but there is such a minuscule amount of them. Overall, that is perhaps the biggest flaw of Sonic Frontiers to me. It is a Sonic game with near zero replayability in its levels. Even the entries in the series I'm lukewarm on, like Heroes, I will still go back to from time to time because I want to play levels like Metropolis. However, Without a reason like this video, I can't imagine myself ever wanting to come back and play Frontier's stages. Which, given the series' track record, it just makes me sad to actually say.
Well, with one level narratively and a 10 minute dissection of the game's design behind us, we find ourselves into the land of Mario in Unreal Engine YouTube videos, where a mysterious voice in the sky tells Sonic his friends have been trapped in cyberspace, with only him being able to escape. And if we wish to save those friends, we must defeat the four titans. We'll be talking about Sonic first though, as I find my feelings towards Sonic in these games often reflect my opinions as a whole, with Frontiers being no exception to that end, as I have very mixed feelings. In keeping with my previous statements, I was interested in seeing Ian write for the games, and generally agree with the sentiment that in recent years, his writing was often preferable to Pontac's. However, to me his biggest flaw has always been writing Sonic himself. To me, Sonic is a force of good, but not necessarily because he wants to be a hero or even acts heroic intentionally. Oh, yeah! This could be fun! He's a good person by nature, despite his carefree attitude. Most importantly, Sonic doesn't necessarily change, but should bring about change in others. These qualities are true of Sonic throughout the classic era, up to and including Black Knight. But I don't think Flynn has ever really nailed the nuances of these elements. True to Ian's comic book roots, Sonic in IDW and subsequently this game is written to be very superhero-like. In IDW, we've seen him trying endlessly to convince Metal Sonic to change and become a hero, and consequently, having hissy fits over the Doctor's creation being consistent with everything we've seen in the character since Inception, to Sonic further being melodramatic about Eggman escaping after a fight, questioning how long they're going to continue this cycle pondering if Eggman will ever truly turn over a new leaf. Now, I don't think there's anything that bad in this game, but these examples should, well, exemplify perfectly what I'm getting at. As a whole, Sonic's writing under Flynn has him constantly chasing the idea of heroism and justice, while lacking the independence and abrasiveness the Blue Blur had since his creation. Again, it's not that he isn't ultimately a hero, someone willing to help anyone, but it's about how the current approach stands in stark contrast to how he used to be portrayed. It's no use, but why can't I defeat you? Huh, because we're Sonic Heroes! Sonic! Anytime you want a rematch, just let me know. I'll be waiting. My third wish! For Razor Jin, you shall live out the rest of time trapped inside your lamp as you were in days of old! Kara, I know you're there. Please stop him. We can start over. The two of us. I swear. I swear it. The world is mine. I cannot be denied by that filthy rat. Why? I told you, I'm not a rat! I'm a hedgehog! This must be it! Are you ready? Ready for what? If you remove that sword and defeat King Arthur with it, you shall forever be the worst of knights, slayer of kings! Guess I can't be the hero every time! I find these qualities both essential to understanding the character and one of the most appealing aspects about him. In some ways, the current iteration doesn't feel all that different from the meta-happy-go-lucky Sonic people complain about. He's still missing those edges, and I think this is further hurt by how Sonic doesn't even sound like himself for a large portion of the game. See, when Frontiers was initially shown, it was very evident Roger Craig Smith was doing a different voice for some reason. Sonic Twitter was practically creaming themselves over this, which I was baffled by. Uh, I don't even know what work I'm interfering with. I'll be back before you can do a fortune card reading. Uh, yo, don't you think that Titan was kind of overkill? Roger is just talking in his normal voice for parts of this game, and the praise it received can only be described from my perspective as typical social media contrarianism, where it's different so therefore it is good. But that said, I didn't blame Roger, as I've always liked Roger despite the fandom's distaste for his prior performances. Jason will always be my Sonic, but I've consistently stated I think Roger is a great VA who is just never given good material for the character. You reek of fear. Glad to see I left an impression. 
That's not fear. I ran all the way over here. I'm supposed to be the fastest, but I was too slow to save my buddy. Yet, many people put the blame on him before suddenly praising the guy when he kind of dropped the whole acting part of voice acting. So to me, it was obvious that it was an issue of direction. Where, lo and behold, later interviews with the cast have shown us even Roger wasn't for this performance he gave. The English voice director constantly telling him to go deeper, and to leave his sonic voice behind. Whereas, Roger himself seemed as perplexed as I am by this. Because he was just like, it's going to be a little deeper, it's a little more, you know, and I'm thinking for Sonic, so I'm like, okay, you know, it's over, Egghead, and he's like, a little deeper, and I'm like, it's over, Egghead, a little deeper, <laughs> it's over, Egghead, it's like, a little deeper, it's over, Egghead, and he's like, right there, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is, I think he knew how inferior this performance was, and as the game goes on, Sonic's inflection returns to something more fitting of the character, and the improvement in quality is so apparent when you listen to them back to back. Maybe as I am, but I'm willing to bet I could handle it as supersonic. All I need are the Chaos Emeralds. I'm so used to using the Chaos Emeralds, it's kind of hard to accept they're from space. I've seen people try to say this is done for narrative reasons, but this doesn't make any sense. If anything, it should be in reverse, as the corruption takes over Sonic, and we see him get more worn out. That chipper tone should fade not come back. This is clearly bad voice direction. Even when it improves later, I don't think it reaches the best Roger can do, because he was put in a position where he was limited, thus hurting the character further, as he doesn't have the snarky carefree personality we talked about in the writing or the performance. So that said, it's a mixed bag. As the story progresses, we'll find that when Sonic is having a cute moment with Amy, reassuring tales of their friendship, or having a friendly rivalry with Knuckles. The positives can very much outweigh the negatives, so don't take my qualms with Sonic's attitude and direction as a general dismissal of everything done with the character. There is certainly good to be seen later, just not when it comes to the core of Sonic himself unfortunately, which is a fairly important aspect to me and I hope you've come to understand why that is. But for now, it's time to get acquainted with Kronos Island. Oh well, some direction is better than none. Here we go. Sonic games are known to put their best foot forward, with their first levels tending to stick in people's mind. And as far as the islands are concerned, I think that's true of Kronos. Its layout is very open and it's easy to move around in. It's probably the nicest looking Unreal Asset Bundle of all the locations. Really, having the most. Oh man, that's just begging to be climbed. Imagine the view. Going on. So yeah, I kind of like it, especially after the free updates made it much more fun to speed through and fling yourself up into the sky. While I was more negative on it in the cyber stages, these areas were actually built with Sonic's kit in mind, and only improved as you added more tools for Sonic to traverse with. There are some core issues with the game that never went away as we talked about, however, those issues are minor to the fun playground Kronos can be when just engaging in the exploration aspect. That said, let's talk about what you have to do to actually progress though. It should be obvious that Frontiers is looking to ape Breath of the Wild. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that Nintendo fans overhype what Breath did for the industry. Much of its design philosophy is identical to Ubisoft games, but iteration isn't bad, it's just seen as bad by many. What Breath did was take a lot of those concepts that were boring and repetitive integrating them in ways that sought to improve or adjust the execution, as well as adding onto those ideas with new mechanics, in turn making those once tedious activities fun. If Frontiers approached its iteration in a similar manner, I would have no issue, but it often comes off as a cheap imitation. Let's take the challenges. In Breath of the Wild and its sequel for that matter, these puzzles would challenge you on certain abilities, player skill, and just all around ask the player to engage with its systems whether it was following the rules or making your own. I'll always regret not having this recorded, but to give an example, when playing and streaming to my friends, I entered the Two Bomb Shrine, where I proceeded to self-impose a challenge of never using more than one bomb. The first sections were easy. When I got to the third though, it seemed impossible. One friend interjecting just that, when another said she believed in me, though knowing her it was more to be contrarian. But regardless, as I was giving up, 
I shot myself up to the top of the contraption and randomly took out my fire wand, accidentally using it and you know what? That accidental fireball began to bounce back and forth, quickly turning off and on the machine, thus raising the platform I needed to finish the puzzle. And let me tell you, in that moment I heard Anamura clapping like a seal, though it might have just been the cheers of my friends. But the point is, my playthrough is often like this. It's exciting, it can make you feel smart and test you on game mechanics. In Frontiers, you stand still and hold the boost button, or do a side loop, and then another side loop, and another. And really, most problems in this game are solved this way. You shouldn't even bother thinking about it, just do a side loop. Even outside of the challenges, a good amount of my recorded gameplay is spinning around in circles because they thought it would be such a great idea to lock your max speed behind having the maximum ring count until the end game. You are actively disadvantaged throughout your playthrough if you don't play in this way, as even certain mini bosses practically require max speed. These challenges, the mini bosses, it's all so boring, tedious. And I feel like they knew that, because not only does the Psy loop draw up rings when you do this maneuver, literally every collectible in this game can be grinded this way, or overstepped by simply fishing. The way you interact and make use of the world isn't a step forward, it's a step backwards, even further back than some of those Ubisoft games. The best thing I can say about it is, once again, Kronos can be fun to move around it, but in a tech demo sort of way. There's nothing to actually do. Most of the challenges ask you to come to a halt in fact. That leaves us with combat. This conceptually sits better with me. Some of the coolest moments in Sonic history are the spectacle of seeing him do crazy tricks and maneuvers and cutscenes, and I appreciate the games that attempt to bring that aspect of Sonic into gameplay. The combat in Frontiers I very much feel is designed in the same way and it can feel exhilarating when given the right set pieces, but it has two fatal flaws in my opinion. The more egregious of that is once again tedium. Sonic should feel fast and kinetic. That is something I feel no one will argue with. Yet this game has some of the worst hit stop in the series. To explain what I mean by this, look at the Adventure Era or other modern titles, or really any other game that is in 06. When you execute a homing attack, you can instantly act out of it. This feels good and keeps you moving. Here, Sonic comes to a halt briefly. This time when you could not control your character is hit stop. And this is a mechanic baked into the entirety of his moveset, not just his homing attack. Everything is like this, which feels at odds with what the game is trying to execute. Sonic should not feel as if he's moving and controlling in a manner similar to new Kratos. He should be moving with the fast paced kinetic energy of Dante from the DMC series. So why I like a lot of the moves on a visual level, when isolated, the combat doesn't feel fun. Even more so because going back to the mini bosses, many have you spend most of the time waiting for the boss to let you attack rather than actually attacking. So much feels like it's designed around wasting your time, and that's not what I want in a Sonic fight. You can ask me to wait for an opening, but make it engaging. Have me constantly moving and dodging instead of periodically doing no more than tapping left or right every 30 seconds. Which leads me into the other issue. Even when in combat, there is very little reason to interact with the system, not even a superficial one like a ranking system. I've watched a friend beat the entirety of the game on the hardest difficulty of the time simply by just holding down the left trigger. DMC is again something to look toward for how this type of system should work. The game doesn't need you to execute at a high level to succeed, but it rewards you for doing so, both superficially and within how combat can flow at a high level. What if this awful hit stop was just a punishment? If you want to spam moves and not think about combat, you could, even beating hard mode in this way, as that's not inherently an issue. However, if you times your execution, your inputs properly, maybe you could be rewarded with having no hit stop on your moves. Skilled players would be encouraged to keep a rhythm then, but as is, it is a far cry from just about every other action game on the market. I have more fun with the basic systems presented in past titles as a result. However, I guess the next question is, to what end are these challenges and fights actually rewarding you? Whether you do them or choose to go about acquiring said rewards hey, Sonic. by other means, you need to hit thresholds in order to advance the story, this giving you interactions with one of the game's antagonists the Korok-like Coco creatures, or the island's designated friend, which in the case of Kronos, would be Amy Rose.
Hey, still thinking about the Coco? Yeah, and more. I'm not sure what happened, but I know what I saw. A love that transcended time. I believe in that power. When this is over, I want to share that love with the world. Even though it may take us far apart. I know you'll do great. I want to hear all about it when you come back. Now, this is actually a little unfortunate that Amy comes first, as I do think a lot of characters in this game are handled well, but Amy is still not one of them. My feelings toward her in a lot of ways, perhaps fittingly, coincide with those I express with Sonic. In fact, I feel even stronger toward how Ian and other subsequent media have begun to handle Amy Rose in recent iterations. It should come as no surprise when I say the past decade has seen a severe decline in how female characters across the board are approached, when under the pen of a western writer. And it's no doubt something you've heard ad nauseum. Now, Amy certainly isn't anywhere near the worst of this. She hasn't foregone her character to become the girl boss trope that festers throughout media these days. Well, in most portrayals anyway. But I think she still lost what was a large appeal to her character, due to a similar circumstance of these writers wanting to shy away from certain portrayals of females. Early on, I believe Amy could be seen as a mirror to Tails, in a similar manner to the young fox boy looking up to Sonic after he was subsequently saved. So did Amy. But the result of this was more feminine in nature. While Tails in some ways strives to be like Sonic, seeing him as a brother, Amy's feelings were manifested in affection. She fell in love. She made it her goal to support and follow him to the ends of the earth. But she wasn't simply a mindless fangirl, as many try to portray her as. In fact, she was willing to stand up to Sonic in Adventure 1 to protect Gamma, because that's what she thinks is right. In some ways, Amy is the one who's more traditionally heroic and idealistic, not Sonic. The whole crutch of her arc in that game is selflessly reuniting a bird with its family and her outlook on the world, whether it's the beauty she finds in existence itself or the beings that populate it. This is what ultimately changes not only Gamma, but later in Adventure 2, Shadow as well. Amy is the one that reminds him of what Maria's last wish truly was. These traits can largely be traced back to that day, to the heroism she saw in Sonic as he saved her. Now, to be clear, I'm not arguing Amy isn't a fangirl at all. I'm arguing that it's not a bad thing that this is one of her traits, and I fail to see why it's treated as such, especially when other characters admire Sonic in similar ways. Sonic himself clearly has affection for Amy, caring a lot about her. You could say that's more interpretive, but they literally used to go on dates in canon. It's just become more downplayed as the Japanese side has slowly gotten less control of the franchise. The idea that she was some stalker and that this was a toxic relationship seems to simply be the result of the peak pseudo-intellectualism that has become so rampant on YouTube and social media. Sonic being somewhat dismissive was always played for fun, or personal embarrassment. It was a cute dynamic that both suited his more cool, laid-back personality and the boldness of Amy Rose. Moreover, that's probably the worst part nowadays. Whenever this affection is mentioned, Amy is the one portrayed as embarrassed, like it's something to hide. This isn't her character. It sucks. This question comes from the Emu Emmy. What do you like about Sonic? Oh, wow. That's such a hard question to answer. Probably because there's not much to like. Hey, listen. Sonic is strong. He's thoughtful, intelligent, and always puts the people closest to him first. I'm a better person having met Sonic, and I mean it. Who couldn't love a hedgehog like that? Oh, <laughs> love, you say? Like! I said like, Tails! I believe it to be far more endearing to see her proclaim Sonic as hers proudly showing her love, as opposed to being completely embarrassed and denying it. The fact that Amy managed to be both feminine and bold in your face at times was what made her character appealing. These days, she's just the girl. That's her personality, where it starts and ends. Yet it's much better than the opposite route of her being an insufferable girl boss, but we lost something here far more than we did with Sonic. To that end, her arc in this game is rather pointless having a want to find beauty in the world and share it with others. 
The issue here isn't that this is out of character, but in that it's treated as a new revelation that she needs to seek out. For a lot of characters in this game, there was a clear conscious choice to try and return them to their writing of old, getting traits back, putting them on a path they once walked. However, for Amy, she never lost this trait even in more recent games. It's all she was. So it's less of Flynn getting the character on track and more doubling down on the current trajectory of the character, while parading around an illusion of there being something here. Listen, Amy has always been my favorite character in the series, right up there with Sonic. While it's been really nice to see her get more of a spotlight recently with the classic portrayals particularly nailing the execution, it just makes me a little sad that the version of the character that initially endeared me so much to her is often misunderstood or misspoke about, while being replaced by an iteration that is seemingly designed around appeasing the criticism only from those who dislike the character to begin with. So for that fact, as far as the characters go, Amy is by far the worst in the game for me. That said, let's talk more about her place in the overarching story. Frontiers has it set up that early on each of the islands has their own little arc relating to the Coco, the new child-like mascot creatures for this game. For Kronos it deals with a Coco that wants to see her friend, Amy doing all she can to get that creature to the other, and along this journey, we find out it's a bit more complicated. As you progress, we eventually see flashback sequences that show these chaos-like beings attempting to reach each other in their final moments before their death. From there, we can infer what we saw is related to the current narrative, as once the vision ends, both Coco seem to pass on with a smile on their face. The specifics of which aren't clear, but I think it's easy enough to understand that we help these creatures pass on, as we were seeing their past, and while I can't say this or future Coco stories pull on the heartstrings all that much, I do see a positive here. This game is going to actually sit with more upsetting or serious moments. The past few entries had to interlace just about everything with snark or a joke. It was very rare the games would take themselves seriously, but here is some legitimate weight, and I appreciate that. Where at its conclusion, we once again return to what we discussed with Amy. She decides she wants to show others the beauty in the world for whatever that entails. And as for Sonic, the end of these scenes signifies to us that we will be approaching the first boss of the game. Taken on the whole, I think supersonic sections in most Sonic games are actually a bit weaker in terms of gameplay. Usually they're carried by their OST, narrative weight, and many other factors that boil down to spectacle, which I'm not necessarily saying should take away from how cool they are. In fact, I'm only bringing this up to illustrate how much goes into making these moments special. As Sonic Frontiers does not simply have one of these moments, it has multiple, and they didn't skimp on these either. To the point of many people who have never played Metal Gear Rising, drawing comparisons to that game's over-the-top boss fights as well. So it would be no exaggeration to say the majority of these encounters approach the level of the better supersonic fights in the series, being by far the highlight of the game, both in the gameplay department and that spectacle, with each of them individually containing their own lyrical piece accompanying them, similar to your Live and Learns or with Mii's, and it leaves an impression. heights felt in these moments really can't be understated. When the years come to pass, people will look back fondly on this game simply for its bosses. So let's talk about them. Typically, at the beginning of each fight you start with the six emeralds you've collected on the island, where you're then tasked with climbing the titan to reach the seventh, thus beginning the boss proper as Super Sonic. With the first fight with Giganto, he definitely has the wow factor of being the first as being dropped into this area and needing to climb this titan all Shadow of the Colossus style 
leaves you with a really cool feeling. Far more so than the towers these mechanics were used for previously. Then once the fight actually begins, it's anything but Shadow of the Colossus. Giganto is spinning, punching, shooting lasers, and frankly, so are you. It's frantic and fast paced, fitting to the music blaring in your ears all the way until you deliver the final blow. And can I take a moment to say, I legitimately like quick time events, when executed in the manner these bosses have them. They certainly can miss the mark, and trust me, they often do, even in other parts of this game. But when it's for tying the player to the spectacle of a climactic fight, for a brief cutscene, I think it really shines as an idea, with each boss managing to incorporate these quick time scenes to some extent. Next we have the second boss, Wyvern, one I don't hear talked about all that much, which I feel this is mostly a result of his placement in the game being in the middle. You don't have the previous wow factor or the highs and lows we will get to shortly. For me though, what sticks out about his fight is the scope of it. As with the other bosses, the arena is confined to a relatively small area, but with Wyvern, he flies around the whole island. You're chasing him before he dives in for a quick attack, that you must swiftly counter. It's fun. Sonic swinging him around and throwing this gigantic titan into the Toriyama wasteland is up there with my favorite visuals in the game. Following that, there's Knight who is a particular standout. I used the word swiftly to describe counters just a moment ago, but that's kind of a lie. In Frontiers, there is no counter timing. If you're holding the buttons, you got it. And while not ideal mechanically, the game is clearly designed around this, with low readability when it comes to the precise timing of the hitboxes. In fact, when the game first came out, people thought I was a gaming god on stream because of my perfect execution rate, which was holding the buttons for a good 10 seconds before I needed to. However, I'm saying this because Knight not only possesses probably the best song in the game, but also the fight that I think demands the most of you, as while your counter is essentially free. You actually have to position and time yourself relative to Knight's movements to properly throw his shield back at him. But what would a Knight be without his sword? As the last element of why Knight is the best is the fact that like a great game before it, this fight allows Sonic to take up a sword, stealing it from the Titan and slicing him right down the middle, making it easily not only my favorite fight mechanically, but in the cinematic sense as well. The only fight that doesn't live up to the high bar set is sadly the last supersonic fight, Supreme. He feels rather lackluster compared to the other three, though I think it's evident it was more of a result of the fight not being finished, opposed to bad design. As in the code of the game, there are still many animations and quick time events associated with him that go unused, and even without this information, the average player can easily observe how his transformation into his wing mode doesn't actually do anything. They immediately disappear unlike the other boss transformations that visually and mechanically affect the fight. At least, somewhat. Imagine if this encounter had him flying around the island taking shots at Sonic with his gun. That's pretty close to what's already here and what seemed like a natural evolution, whereas the current iteration of the fight just feels unfinished, even having weird hit detection at times. And it's probably not helped by the fact that it's tasked with following up Knight. That said, it's still an alright fight. But truly, if the only downside I can give to these supersonic fights is that one isn't as good as the others, I'd say that's a pretty good mark of quality. So let's move the discussion to Island 2 and those that inhabit it. Ages ago, my people were wiped out by a cataclysm. I know the Coco faced something similar. It reminds me I'm the last Echidna, that I'm alone. You may be the last, but you're not alone. You got us, knucklehead. I'll admit, I do envy your lifestyle. Freedom to go where you want, when you want. So do it. Get out there and live a little. Maybe I could. But first, I need to be back to normal. So hurry up and get me back to normal. Anything to get you away from me. <laughs> <laughs> After the defeat of Giganto and the loss of the Emeralds upon reaching Ares Island, this area sees us attempting to save Knuckles, which brings into question. 
what is he doing here? We didn't see him in the opening with the rest of the gang, but fortunately, the answer to this question actually keeps the positivity rolling. We do learn from speaking with him a brief description of the event. There was one of these ancient shrines by his island that he discovered. But this leads us to what I would actually like to talk about, Sonic Frontier's Prologue Divergence. As I mentioned long ago, extended media should be used to extend the media, not take it away. That's exactly how Divergence is set up, as we don't play as Knuckles, we're following Sonic in this game, and the amount of information we're given is more than serviceable. However, this short allows us to see the events described to us in beautiful detail. Even if it brings into question how he, in all these years, never noticed the shrine sitting next to him. But overall, it serves as a positive example of Knuckles' writing. The opening monologue captures the more introspective and thoughtful elements of Knuckles that we've lost over time, really calling back to his opening in Sonic Adventure 1 in its execution. Which kind of brings me to how Knuckles has been in a weird place for a long time. Now, even in the better eras of this series, Due to the nature of his character, Knuckles initially being the guardian of the Master Emerald back in Sonic 3 meant some work had to be done to justify him into the plot of later games. I mean, it only took to Adventure 2 for us to begin reusing similar plot elements, so it was obvious that this was going to get old fast. And on top of that, this also heavily restricted storytelling, leading the developers to eventually dropping even mentioning it over the course of the series, just having Knuckles show up with the gang. I don't necessarily think this was the wrong choice, but the implementation and transition left a lot to be desired, especially with how he was characterized as a result. Going back to Adventure 1, we learn Knuckles is a bit of a loner, and troubled. Further, it's not that Knuckles is the brightest, but what is often attributed to stupidity at this point in time is more of a result of the character not having an upbringing involving others. He's gullible because he lacks people skills. I understand that as you bring him into the crowd, naturally, it's very easy to slip these traits into ones that closer resemble pure stupidity. As the whole fish out of water element becomes less believable, the more both the character and the audience sees the character interacting with others. However, Knuckles lived on his lonesome his entire life. It's realistic that once he begins to exist in an environment that has other people, even with friends, that a lot of his mannerisms won't just fade away. Your upbringing often defines a lot of who you are. Gullibility to some extent would be one of those things that fade, I imagine, and frankly, it should in his case. The real misstep is keeping this element directly the same. But there are ways to still make him a fish out of water, even comedically, while not sacrificing his character. It remains to be seen what the third Sonic movie does with Knuckles. But I think the little we saw toward the end of Sonic 2 shows glimpses of this, from the way he speaks or how he approaches situations. And if you would like a more detailed example, from something I'm sure all of us have at least a little familiarity with, I think even Marvel movies used to be able to pull this off. Specifically in how Ragnarok and Infinity War handled Thor. He's not treated as just an idiot in those movies. In fact, we see him act quite smart, figuring out his brother's schemes, or outplaying him at them learning from past encounters. Throughout these movies at times, despite showing competence, he'll display behaviors that seem odd, otherworldly, and disconnected from the way people normally carry themselves or speak. His confidence is also a frequent foil, which Knuckles is no stranger to as well, obviously. I'm not saying to copy this verbatim, and later movies. Show us how easy it is to fumble those elements and slip back into making the character the butt of the joke, like Knuckles is oh so used to. However, the point is, while not easy, there's ways to still keep these more, let's say, charming aspects to Knuckles, without making him a brain-dead idiot who just wants to punch things. While I don't think we've seen enough to say we've truly moved away from that point, the prologue short and some other choice elements in this game show some promise. That said, let's talk more about what we do see in the story. The Ancients the mysterious entities of this game have some clear similarities to the Echidnas, from architecture to their connection with the Chaos Emeralds. Both Sonic and Knuckles bring attention to this quite frequently, and as time goes on, Knuckles ends up feeling a connection to these old ruins, and the soldiers who were also tasked with protecting their land so long ago. These Coco encompass the main plot of this island, where they find peace in their story once Sonic helps them, 
and defending the land that they passed away attempting to save. Though one has to wonder why they run away and bomb you in your attempt to do so, but hey, I'm not a game designer. Nevertheless, the conclusion to this arc is what's interesting. It's not for Knuckles to sit in those feelings of loneliness and stay in the past as these creatures literally did. It's that he's envious of Sonic. He wants to go out into the world and experience it for himself. The majority of his existence has been sitting on his island, alone, or being thrust into conflict. Which again, yeah, I view this as a good setup for Knuckles, as something does need to change in the trajectory of his character. But the important distinction is, it's not because there's a core issue with Knuckles, in fact, it's to keep that core, a relevant part of him, instead of further undermining it like many games and other media of the past have done. The one worry I have going forward is that the Master Emerald needs to be addressed, in some way. Whether it's setting up protection using the island's technology with the help of Tails, or just shoving it up his butt like he did for all of Adventure 2. Because yeah, it is the legacy of his people, and that is certainly something that should mean something to him, and does in prior entries. Maybe he'll become a treasure hunter, an explorer, who knows. But what's on display is a good starting point to returning those old, more somber, or introspective qualities, while also not needing to make a million excuses every time they want him to be with his friends. I'd say the only true negative aspect is once again the voice direction. Knuckles just sounds dopey, like it's the type of inflection you give to a character you want to portray as an idiot, and it seems extra at odds because the writing for him isn't like that most of the time. He has interesting ideas or things to say about much of the discoveries, with the friendly rivalry on display from both him and Sonic being the best we've seen in oh so long. The banter between them seems heavily charged, but in a way that isn't antagonistic. It's really bouncy and playful, challenging the other the fire back. Further, I'd say these are easily some of the best character animations in the game, and more than any other dynamic I will discuss, I want more of this. It should be stated though, that it's also balanced really well. When Knuckles gets down about the thoughts we just discussed, Sonic is there to reassure him. But the scene itself is particularly well done because it seems like he's about to go in with the jab, due to their usual dynamic, but quickly stops himself realizing it's not the time, where he then struggles a bit with what to say, until Knuckles gives him an easy place to drop the reassurance, in which they, once again, go back to the usual. It's no exaggeration that when it comes to legacy characters, I have the most goodwill toward Knuckles, and can only hope that will be paid off. With that said though, let's talk more about the island that Knuckles has found himself on. Alright, story time. Typically going into these videos, I begin writing a rough draft on each section of the game, be it gameplay, narrative, characters, and what have you, based on my thoughts from my initial playthrough. I do this in the hopes of allowing me to both challenge and strengthen the notions I held prior as I begin my recordings for the video ideally leading to a more thought out script. However, when it came to Frontiers, I had an issue. Once I hit narrative, I stopped writing, because as I tried to remember the events of Ares Island and the next location, I couldn't recall what happened. So I asked my friend what she thought about the game's story, just to maybe prompt my own head to get some notes down. And she sends me a text that simply says, story. I laughed as, while this is an obvious over-exaggeration, it further compounded the feeling that I was having, that something was there but I couldn't recall it. See, lack of story isn't usually a bad thing by any means. I'd say something like Breath, which I continue to reference as this game attempts to mirror it in many ways, has a similar structure. It's narratively intense at the beginning and end, with some nice moments between, and I never saw that as an issue. In fact, a lot of the games I enjoy are narratively shallow. So the problem isn't that the game lacks story in relation to its runtime, but it ties into the very idea that I forgot something. Because after playing this game for the video, I realized, yeah, I did forget something. And that was all of the fluff. This is persistent throughout the entire game, but truthfully, I didn't know where to put it before deciding on here for a lack of things to say about the next two islands other than architectural comments. The reason for this is, most of the interactions you're working through all those tedious challenges and tasks for are sort of tedious themselves. The majority of the scenes along the way are just repeated exposition, 
empty or meaningless dialogue. Or, perhaps the worst of all, the Family Guy cutaway-esque writing of so many interactions. I think a lot of people give this a pass because we were just so starved for continuity before Frontiers. But here this game onslaughts you with constant, hey, remember the time? Like it's not always inorganic. Sometimes it seems natural for a character to bring up a past event or a correlation, and I do like that when it works. But when about 85% of it feels like it's there to wink at the camera, it ends up even spoiling the good callbacks because you question the references. Again, I'm not saying don't pull from the past, but use it naturally. Because at present, this is a very annoying overcorrection, and it has more issues that will crop their head up soon. However, as far as those architectural comments go, Ares is complicated, as I think it used to be the worst island in the game. Unlike Kronos, it has a lot of areas split off, and originally, you needed to find very specific paths to get to them because of the fact that the game had no momentum. You would try to do a cool jump or build up speed to shoot you to part of the island, which this kind of design naturally makes a person want to think about and lean into. But you just couldn't. It sucked and made this area a drag to get through. Then with later updates, this thankfully was fixed and made Ares a far less frustrating experience as far as pure traversal was concerned, due to the addition of momentum options. However, I can't say the same for many other elements. We've already spoken on the specifics of why the mini bosses are tedious back on Kronos, but Ares is where these boring philosophies reach new heights. With how these fights become far more designed around having the player stand around and watch an elongated cinematic or QTE for the upteenth time, just to be preceded by some gimmick encounter. But perhaps the worst of this is that it's not just the mini bosses now. Even normal enemies will pull your camera away, or lean heavily into design that is far more focused around wasting the player's time, when they often weren't even trying to trigger this encounter in the first place. And speaking of standing, you're going to be doing a lot of it. As you progress to these new islands, it's not just the fights that become bigger time wasters, even the puzzles as we have been so nicely referring to them as. See an uptick in these elements, with some on each island being locked at certain times of the day. And unlike literally every other open world game in existence, that has a time mechanic. You can't speed this up at the press of a button, or by going to a certain area. No, if you need to get this mission done, you'll be planting your feet in the sand for the next 10 minutes. Where, might I suggest, playing multiple levels of a better Sonic game in that time to really exemplify how far people's standards have fallen to call this game the best in the series. To summarize then, on every level, the second island isn't even on par with the first. The majority of reasons <laughs> aren't new issues, mind you. Instead, every problem that existed before only increases in tedium and volume. So let us move to the third and hope it fares better. Chaos Island is dog shit. I've yet to really dive into it in any of these Sonic videos, but I really have not been a fan of the handling of these 2D sections in the modern games. When it came to Unleashed and Generation's main boost stages, just using 2D sections for quick, tight platforming. I'd say they nailed it, but some other games in this series feel like they're keeping me hostage with how much I'm stuck in the second dimension. I want to play a 3D Sonic game. So while this has been a problem for a while, I have never been quite as baffled by its execution. Like, let me ask you, what is the appeal of open world level design? I imagine most people would say it's in the name. It's open. It's a huge area to play around in and explore. Yet Chaos, the island, every few steps locks you into what I will generously call a 2D platforming challenge. And it's so frustrating because you're just trying to go somewhere. You can see where you want to be, it's right there on the Z-axis, but you aren't. Often, instead, you accidentally step into a set of springs that will fling you even further from your destination. It's just a mess. It feels so poorly thought out, and the drab, lifeless look of chaos is perhaps perfectly fitting to how much I dislike this area. It has all the issues of the previous islands, and then some. The only other thing of interest I can really even talk about 
is at some point the game makes you play pinball. That's not really a surprise or even a negative for a Sonic game inherently. Pinball has always been closely tied to the series, but it's usually optional. Either completely so or failing it never punished you, offering alternative routes. However, here you're tasked with getting a rather large high score by the Ancients, apparently, to proceed with the story. I never had fun interacting with this. It could even be outright frustrating at times if the pinball gods of ancient times didn't feel particularly favorable on that playthrough. Get away from there, please. <laughs> Come on, dude, that's not fair. And it just feels like yet another example of the tedious padding spread throughout the game. Chaos really is just the pinnacle of it all. From the issues of the previous islands to the new attempts to slow you down. Whether they be railroading you in the 2D sections, or the fact that dig spots, where you previously would get tons of collectibles, are more than likely springs. Meaning you'll be grinding for material longer, but hey, at least Sonic actually appears to be breathing on this island instead of looking at you like a lifeless doll. Hey little bro, feeling better? Yeah, this whole experience gave me a kind of clarity. When this is all over, I think I need to go it alone for a while. I can't grow into my full potential if I always fall back on you. If that's okay. <laughs> You're free to go your own way. I guess you just grew up on me a little faster than I expected. Are you saying I outpaced you? Yeah, don't push it. Perhaps the one thing I can give Chaos Island is that it contains tales. Ian wasn't handed an easy job with him. In the current canon, he's been completely regressed to a husk of his former self, where previously, Tails' original big arc was him learning to stand up for himself, not solely relying on Sonic despite the fear he might possess. While as we got deeper into the Pontac era, that fear itself became his sole character trait, being reduced to a child crying in the corner, with emotional tantrums for plot convenience. So when it came to Frontiers, what ended up being landed on was a criticism of this internally, from the writing. And it doesn't just exist in a meta sense to nod and wink at the audience, before moving on. It was naturally integrated into the plot and treated as something to be addressed. Tails himself reflects on how he's become wildly inconsistent, that he slipped back into being comfortable just relying on Sonic again, and wishing to recapture that version of himself that was once able to stand up to the villainy of the world. Sonic in response reassures him that it's nothing to worry about, as they're best buddies. And I like that of course, even if in some ways, Tails truly has become a burden. Now with Tails being the youngest character here, I find it perfectly logical that he could slip back into the comfort of just letting Sonic do everything and protect him. Especially so considering his arc was never that Tails became brave in the same way as Sonic, nor was it that he was no longer afraid of Eggman. He was brave because he stood up to Eggman in spite of those emotions. And I do hope that is something that will not be lost as we move forward. We have plenty of characters who scoff in the face of danger, but some people just can't be that person. In some ways it's even more admirable to see a character like this. So just as I don't want to see Tails cower in fear every time there's a threat, I also don't want to have a literal clone of Sonic. But speaking on what we got here, yeah, I think this is about as well as you could execute the return of Tails' character. It not only doesn't sweep the problem away, but also integrates a natural reason for why it occurred, and has Tails realize he needs to change for both the good of himself and others, where he concludes that he has to leave Sonic's side until he's able to stand as his equal, not someone who needs to constantly be saved. Now, does this new story beat make the past decade of writing good because it has some sort of payoff? No, absolutely not. But I think its execution should be acknowledged with how well it was implemented. Further, this brings me to a conclusion I had begun to draw over the course of the story in relation to Sonic's friends. Each arc ends with a character making some sort of declaration, that they need to go out into the world to find something independent of Sonic. I don't think this is merely a thematic thread. I believe this game is attempting to set up a lot for the future, more specifically, for the next game in the 3D series, to be in the style of a Sonic adventure game. One where we take each of these characters on their own journey, 
ultimately leading to a greater overarching narrative. The fact that the DLC, which hadn't come out by the time of me initially writing this, is centered around playing as these characters, just further strengthens the idea. They're not only setting up the seeds for the future narratively, but the design and mechanics as well. That said, this is all in the future, so let's take a step back and return to Frontiers. Like the two before him, there is also a Coco narrative that connects to Tales. Unfortunately, much like the island itself, it is probably the lesser of the three. Simply involving a pilot Coco that wants to fix up a cannon on the island for the war. Much of the tasks take you across the landscape examining the ancient technology, which actually mostly boils down to hearing Tales and Sonic spit references at one another ad nauseum. But at the very least, after everything this island puts you through, you are rewarded with the previously mentioned best fight in the game, leading us to Island 4 where there's a lot to talk about. That last statement might come as a surprise as Island 4 is just a set of platforming towers. However, not only are they the first enjoyable open zone challenges, but the information you get here is also pretty important for the entire Sonic the Hedgehog series as a whole. Once the player has reached this far in the game, it's become clear that with each step of progress we make, saving our friends defeating those titans, some of the data corruption transfers to Sonic, where this sometimes results in him receiving memories from the ancients. While previously, these would be short scenes toward the end of each island, Rhea gives us several at the completion of every platforming challenge, which again are rather enjoyable. They test you on both your platforming skills and reaction time. Further, if you do mess up despite these being vertical challenges, they actually have pulleys that function as checkpoints. So if the physics get a little wonky because your control scheme wasn't accounted for initially, or hey, maybe you just mess up on your own accord, you don't have to worry about doing the entire tower again, which is good. You have to overcome every part of this challenge, so you're not cheating it by any means. However, it's simultaneously not asking you to redo things you've already proven yourself on. That said, let's return to the reward for these tasks, the visions of the ancients. If you recall way back at the beginning of this script, I made a comparison of the Coco to the Chow, but this would be a comparison that would only become more apt with time, as this ancient species is the Chow, sort of. Early on it's easy to shrug off how their original forms bear a striking resemblance to Chaos, but there's a reason for this, as Chaos and by extension Chows originate from the ancients. They're a civilization from a distant planet, that when attacked by a world eater, simply known as the End, fled their homeworld, taking mystical gems that powered their technology with them, the Chaos Emeralds. Eventually crash landing on Earth due to the Chaos Emeralds being drawn to the Master Emerald, where here they would fight the End and despite their losses, they would seal the creature away. As time passed however, the ones that remained would mutate into the Chow, bringing to a conclusion everything we come to understand from the flashbacks contained within Rhea. And I really hate everything I just said. The most obvious takeaway is that this does flip our previous understanding on its head, as originally the story was that the Emerald's power mutated a Chow into Chaos, whereas this new interpretation made it so this race was all Chaos-like creatures initially that somehow mutated into the Chow, with only that one specific Chow from Sonic Adventure being able to mutate back. This all bringing a host of other questions about those other forms Chaos takes, and various other things regarding the history and prophecy of the events prior. But regardless of how important any of that is to you, retcons never rub the right way. There's always something frustrating about them, specifically when someone who didn't write the original story goes back and changes a core detail that has drastic effects on the original story or a character. But ultimately, the recontextualization is not my main issue, as much as I dislike it. The real problem for me is the Chaos Emeralds being from space. I believe this to be an active misstep, not simply because this is a retcon or anything of the sort. Frankly, the Chaos Emeralds have never been fully explored, but that in and of itself is where the issue lies, as that was a good thing. 
and I dare say it was purposeful. So many stories in this series, while hinging on the emeralds, use them in different ways, connecting them to different lore and civilizations, relying on their versatility. The Echidnas, the Gaia Temples, their time travel properties in 06. These were magical items that seemed to be all purpose and all powerful, for whatever the story needed. There was a certain mystique about them. These unexplained gems that existed throughout time. They could do this because they had no backstory. They went unexplained. Nothing contradicted. And sure, maybe this doesn't inadvertently contradict anything at present, but once you begin explaining the magic, taking away the elements of the mystery, the wondrous nature of the emeralds begin to lose their luster. This approach already causes some issues, and I can only see it causing more if we continue down this road. The thing about previous games, not relying on old lore, meant it wasn't in danger of it being mishandled. The second you bring those elements into the picture, you're going to be held to a higher standard. That is why I might seem harsher on Ian than I ever did before, because he's no longer just doing a non-canon side comic. Any of my issues with him were essentially non-issues because of the medium he was working in, and I thought he showed promise. But not only is he saying the comic is now canon, making all those previous issues into very big deals. I'm also largely not happy with what I've seen in this game. It is my understanding that much like the Pontac era, Kishimoto does the outline, Flynn does the core writing, and then Kishimoto says the script is bad and changes the dialogue for the Japanese release. So I'm not fully sure who to blame here for this. Maybe Ian had to write this way to some extent, but that begs another question. If Kishimoto controls that much of the script, what did Ian contribute to this game beyond puppeting characters into saying, hey, remembered a thing? So if you want to go with that assumption, it just leaves me feeling even less positively on his contribution. However, I digress. What I will say is yes, I do want this series to have lore and scope like it used to, but if you're going to hinge everything on the investment that so many other writers and prior creators have earned, while introducing retcons into that content for your stories, you are putting it all at risk narratively, if it's not handled with the proper care. Moving on, mishandled backstory is not all the narrative Reha has to offer us. At the completion of these flashbacks, Sonic's friends are saved, but it puts Sonic himself in a frozen state, his data, his existence, completely corrupted which is also how we have it confirmed that the definitely not evil voice in the sky was the end, the entire time, with Sonic's friends then teaming up in one last effort to save him. This time it boiling down to simply holding hands around his corrupted body, but I do have to wonder if this scene was originally supposed to be more. It's no secret that this game was rushed and if the friends' playstyles were something they had in mind from the start. I could definitely imagine the original plan was to have them complete the island themselves and collect the emeralds to save Sonic. Though this is just speculation, because as is the scene feels a bit weaker than it should. So not only would it have been a more fitting payoff to having saved all of your friends, but I think it would hit a lot harder. That's not all though, as it's not just Sonic's friends working together. Like so many times before, the good doctor finds himself in a truce with the blue blur for the greater good. However, before we get to the specifics of that, I think it's about time we shine a light on not just the doctor, but his new AI assistant as well. <laughs> then the robot hit him again. <laughs> I look forward to your battle reports once we're home. Home? I'll integrate you into my system. Give you control of the whole Eggnet. I'll have you network all my robots. You'll be a refreshing change of pace from Orbot and Cubot. They are your creations, like me. That would make them like my brothers? Hmm, I suppose so. I look forward to that. For me, Eggman's best portrayals, much like others, tie back to Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 where he was menacing, but we got hints of comedic undertones throughout those games. I'd say as time went on, that dynamic flipped around, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, as long as there's a balance. 
A clear example that succeeds with Eggman in the opposite direction is Unleashed, where Eggman is played for comedy often, but throughout the majority of the adventure, he's still a threat. As for the way Ian has handled Eggman, it's been… interesting? Working within a comic means far more time is available to flesh out Eggman. However, I do use interesting as a descriptor because I don't think Ian's Eggman characterization always works out. For example, I frequently remember his carpet bombing line early on, because it sounds far more like the Joker than Eggman. The idea that it's all just a game and he could win at any time if he was willing to kill is just… Eh. It also sort of implies Sonic is never, ever in danger. I feel this panel is a signifier for everything Ian does wrong with Eggman, but that's not to say these problems are ever present. With so much more time allowed to the character, there's bound to be some good situations or interactions to be found, and I think Frontiers is a shining example of that. As is so often the case, whether it's an invention of his or a game exclusive Big Bad, Eggman has a sidekick of sorts, this time being the AI known as Sage, taking the appearance of a little girl. And this is the dynamic that manages to beat out all others for me in Sonic Frontiers. See, early on their relationship much like the usual for Eggman is strictly that of utility. She's a tool for him to use. But upon being sucked into cyberspace with no chance to escape, much like Sonic's friends at the beginning of the journey, the two manage to bond, with thoughts of longing for a family only seeming to grow the further the game progresses, from interacting with both Eggman and a certain hedgehog. And while it is just Sage at first, Again, Eggman seeing a more utilitarian use of the relationship. That doesn't last. The most evident case of this can be seen in the Doctor's logs. Sage has been crucial to my survival here in cyberspace. Early warnings of hostile entities, guiding me past firewalls, keeping me updated on progress in the real world. She, she's the best. She, it, it, it's a program. An adorable program, a very personable program, a, a uh, I wonder if she has a preference. I never really knew my cousin Maria. Everyone spoke of her like she was very special. All that love for someone who was gone when I was right there. But I have to wonder, back then, was she anything like Sage is now? Sage told the funniest joke during her report. How fast can Sonic screw things up? Instantly, he's the fastest thing alive. I tell you, she's a chip off the old block. Well, for a program, I mean, it's not like she's alive. <laughs> or family, or... Hmm. Who says I can't create life, huh? Just a bunch of proteins bumping together, anyone can do that. A true genius does it with code and electrons. I mean, if I did create life, she would be brilliant and loyal and perfectly effective. And you know why? Because her dad is a genius, that's why. These two's journey is adorable, and a bit tragic by its end. I particularly like how in Eggman's typical egomaniac fashion, even this love for Sage is constantly rooted in his genius, that he created such an amazing daughter. So despite all of my problems with Frontiers, this aspect is something I truly think was a home run. Let's not forget to mention, Sage herself is just very cute. Now to talk about how they bounce off of Sonic though. For Eggman it's somewhat unfortunate, that they don't really interact much, but I think that's fine, because of a reason we'll get into later. This is very much Sage's game. Early on when she meets Sonic, she taunts him frequently assuring his failure in his mission to save his friends, browbeating him with facts and logic, constantly saying ominous things pertaining to the future, and more importantly, questioning Sonic's actions. Because to an AI, his nature doesn't really make sense. Why does he help people he's never known? Why does he push on, even in the face of the inevitable failure her equations present? With all of these questions being met with snark from Sonic, and is even willing to help her despite the frequent attempts on his life. As far back as the first island, I think Sonic also shines here. I mentioned before that Sonic is not a character that changes. I see him as a force of nature that betters all those he interacts with, inspiring them to change. And Sage is very much that character. Over the course of the game, 
she no longer greets Sonic with coldness, her demeanor changing to that of admiration, something that Sage was perplexed by when even the doctor gave hints of such feelings. This isn't even just a thing we see verbally. Visually, her design changes from black to white. And there's other meta results, such as the loading screen switching from a triangle to a jagged circle. However, all that leads us back to where we left off in the story. While it is so often the case that Eggman is willing to team up with Sonic for self-preservation, this instance is a little different, as Sage, after determining the most probable road to success, practically begs Eggman, in the same way an excited child who wants to go on a ride at an amusement park would, and in the same way a frustrated dad who loves his daughter gives a disgruntled yes. Please. So does Eggman. <clears throat> Sonic, I hereby induct you into the Eggman Empire in order you to save us all. Understand? This is not an alliance. And with that team up, we come into the final island of the game. Aranos looks pretty familiar. In fact, so did Reha, both bearing a striking resemblance to Kronos. But there is a reason for this, and it's mostly what we're going to be discussing for this island, as all three previously mentioned areas used to be one. It could be seen as far back as the first trailer, and was even further confirmed in the Sega leak of 2023, that showed us various projects previewed to investors. Although, even if we didn't have all that, it's fairly obvious looking at Kronos' map, that we didn't get to all of it. And these other islands fit right into those missing sections. So not only was the original island chopped up into pieces, further research into the game's files has shown the original final location wasn't even an island. Instead, you were supposed to explore the remains of the ancient ship with Sage, many voice lines still being in the game to give us glimpses into what could have been. Sonic, can you hear me? I have found a new route. Join me. Sonic, I believe I can access the ship's ruins. Join me. It is what remains of the ancient's world ship. It was their arc to this world. I bring this all up because like so many other things, it's just a shame. The ship sounds way cooler than doing Kronos. Again. Uh, again. It probably would have been the most visually distinct area as well. Though there's no way to truly know. What we can say for sure though, is where the blame lays for many of these failings. A rush game is something I've been stating throughout this video, but some questionable choices were clearly purposeful. So that in combination with the visual fidelity of the leaked trailer being so much greater than the final product, leads me to the assumption that many of the changes were made for the Switch. As instead of going the route of most developers, giving the Switch version specifically, to accommodate for its specs. The Sonic team chose to optimize all versions with the Switch in mind, instead of doing additional builds. Booting the game on PC is going to give you a near identical experience. For example, I can only imagine this was a choice made to further save time as, again, this game was rushed to release and Sonic sells best on Nintendo. So knowing everything missed out on in terms of Aranos' placement in the game, I definitely feel sour on it. But ultimately when it comes to critiquing work, I think it's best not to factor in the behind the scenes. Whether it's a troubled development or what could have been. That stuff is definitely interesting to hear about, but I don't think it's worth sympathy or demonizing a game over. The end result is the end result regardless. That's what you're paying for in the end. So with that sentiment, I will say Aranos is probably the best playing open area since the start of the game. Being comparable to Kronos for, well, <laughs> obvious reasons. It's once more fun to explore and fling yourself around. Even the majority of the mini-bosses don't give you the downtime to make a sandwich, as they're beefed up versions of some of the early bosses. And one other positive surprise is this island actually contains a few levels that aren't just ripped from previous Sonic titles. I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but I think these are some of the best. I mean, crazy right? When you designed a level built around the game it will exist in, it turns out to be better than ripping it from another. Really, it feels like a total contrast to Chaos the Island, where it was a slog until the boss, as here the island is rather enjoyable until you hit the climax. 
Which, again, Supreme isn't a total bust, but definitely a letdown. However, while Supreme may be the last supersonic fight, he is not the last boss in the game. That would be the thing looming quite literally over our heads the entire time. The end. All we did was chase it out of its shell. It's retreating into space to regain its true form. Even Supersonic won't be able to stop it. I know what I must do. I must... leave you. I understand. Go. Fulfill your function. Before it regains its full strength. Ladies first! Be careful, dear daughter. He took your home world. He took your lives. Are you going to let him do it all over again? I need your help. We can end this. Please. The feelings left from these scenes really hang in the air, further built upon both by the atmosphere and the music of the final encounter. It's honestly quite the contrast to the rest of the game, and I like it. It's not this big bombastic climax that you might expect. It's somber. A little emotional, with the end giving off all this dialogue about its existence, its purpose. All the teeming chaos of creation brought to order, to neutrality, to nothing. I saw your mind as you ran through my prison. You have fought machines and gods, then were mighty, then were finite. I am infinite. I am nothing. You struggle as so many have done before. It implies a lot of interesting stuff, and this honestly gets me a little excited. I finally care in a positive sense about some of the lore this game brings. In a way, this whole section leans more into beauty, especially with the closing shots. Sonic seen as a singular shooting star shining in the vastness of space. Sage's final wish. fantastic. But to some extent I'm ignoring the giant floating rock in the room, aren't I? People largely don't like this final boss, not for any of the reasons I listed, but instead because of the manner in which you perform the fight, it being a shoot 'em up section. I definitely understand those who didn't like the switch up, but it doesn't bother me for a few reasons. One is bias, actually liking these types of games. But further, a lot of endgame fights in Sonic history heavily deviate from the rest of the game prior in their execution. So I wasn't all that thrown off by this, especially because you aren't playing as Super Sonic. That was the rest of the game. This is Sage's fight, which is just another additional thematic element I like. I'm glad it's her finale. She's the best executed character in the game. This is her story, her arc. And at that fight's conclusion, her father watches on as the debris crash down to Earth. While for Sonic, he finally reunites with his friends, the day saved once again. Though this moment might seem like a happy one in the face of all the destruction and losses, the game's not finished with you. As is so frequently the case with these epilogues, the final heartstring the game pulls has the ending credits set to a song from Sage's perspective, thanking her father for the life he gave her, and all the things she experienced within it, with the last scene showing us Eggman attempting to bring her back. 
This is why I don't have a problem with Eggman's lack of use in this game. Frankly, I am happy to return to the Monster of the Week formula instead of the constant rehash of the past decade. But more importantly, much like Sonic's friends getting set up for an incoming arc, I think Eggman himself is set up well, motivationally, for the next game. I really believe they're going for something Adventure 3-esque, and the obsession with calling back to those games only furthers that belief. My ultimate feelings toward the game overall hinge on what comes next. Perhaps fitting for a game that relies so heavily on the past, it also has one hand in the future. But we live in the present. I can say I really do like the ending. It makes me feel more positively on the game as a whole every time I get to it. Even if looking back, my thoughts overall near <laughs> exclusively land negatively otherwise. However, Sonic Frontiers does not end here. Not even for the reason you probably think as we're going to have to go back to the very beginning and learn about an entirely different Sonic Frontiers. Chaos Control! Sonic has never had a good relationship with localization. Most Japanese properties don't. Back in the classic era, the lore you were given was completely fabricated for anyone outside of its home region of Japan. And as we got into the adventure era, things were looking better. But some of the most notorious made fun of lines in the series, or what many have called awkward writing, were merely the result of poor localization. Granted, I imagine the issues that came about in the adventure era were not as ill intended as they were in the classic era, but as we approach the start of what many fans dub the meta era, things began to look similar, having genuine character moments replaced with fart jokes. However, Sonic Frontiers and much of this so called meta era is an odd case. As you should be aware by now, the writing, or more specifically the dialogue, was headed by Ian Flynn, so one would assume there shouldn't be any localization issues within the script, as it was written by the English writer. And that's true for us. See, Sonic Frontiers finds itself in a different situation, where the Japanese script is the one that came second. Now my dislike toward the common localization process stems from a very simple idea, that I want to see the creator's true intent, the author's vision, and I don't think that should be tampered with on principle. Far too often we see US localizers ruin Japanese media and other foreign entities by inserting their own quirky humor, politics, beliefs, anything to try and make someone else's work their own. But even in cases where it's not as ill intended, just the mere act of altering the original ideas and purpose of elements in a work can make a character, world, or the script suffer because the story was built around those original intentions. So naturally if you were to reverse this process, the result doesn't change. However, it's not that process, as I hinted at previously. Kishimoto did the initial plot outline while Ian filled in everything in between. So even if Flynn is still the main writer, it's not that this plot is devoid of Kishimoto's vision even from inception. And further, Kishimoto didn't change things for political reasons or to spice the script up with dated references. You could say it was the opposite, as he mainly wanted to remove the copious amounts of references and callbacks in the game. And honestly, I wish he was able to keep Flynn on a tighter leash for this aspect when it came to the game overall. In the IDW comics, while it's not always the case, there have been several points in time where it feels like our main cast gets shoved to the side in favor of giving Ian's OCs an opportunity to steal the spotlight. Where in this game, despite not being present, they get their references awkwardly shoved in. I'm a tangle with love climbing around these ruins. And it's just another example of how worries I didn't feel would be a problem when Ian took on the games ended up coming to pass anyway. In fact, some are worse than the comics, this facet being one example, as not just his OCs are shoved in as references, but also the Boom character sticks. From interviews and podcasts, it would appear Flynn just wants everything to be canon, 
And while there is certainly a bit of sarcasm in these words, looking at his actions shows there is some truth to this. Now, even as someone who follows this material across the board, I really don't see this as a good thing for the series' future. Just look at Ian's script, where it's entirely based around referencing the past so you know this old thing is canon. But I think that's only the tip of the issues such a desire could bring, many being much messier in a logical sense. That all said, it is still Flynn's script, and that aspect is something the game was designed around, so it doesn't completely escape the negatives that come with tampering. There are a few scenes that don't exactly match with what the dialogue wants to convey, as a pretty big indicator. Although, I'll be forthright and say, I like a lot of the ideas and even execution in Kishimoto's script. So while I can't condone this mess of a situation, as this setup isn't ideal for anyone, this exercise has me wondering what the game could have looked like if Ian got more say, or what it would be like if solely penned by the Japanese team. I don't believe we've had that in a 3D game since Black Knight, and that's perhaps telling. For me, these stories have always been at their best when it's handled by its country of origin, and at their worst, otherwise. So in saying that, let's talk about what I deem the most interesting differences in the Japanese script, and you can come to your own conclusions in their comparison. The first big one would be Amy Rose's portrayal. And as you'll remember, this is one of my biggest problems with the original script. And starting us off positively here, I gotta say it's so much better. Amy's love for Sonic is not treated as something to hide or shy away from, like the American creators see it. Instead, when she watches the Coco run directly into an active war zone to perish with the other, she reflects on her own actions, how in the past she has often put herself in danger because of that love she holds for Sonic, running in without thinking of the greater consequences, and as a result, she has put him at risk as well. Which as a side note, this is how you handle integrating the past. Instead of hey remember the time cutaway gags, this is a direct reflection on a large amount of Amy's appearances, pre the meta era. Whereas this reflection ultimately results in a similar conclusion to the script we know. But instead of some vague nonsense about seeing beauty in the world, a feature which, again, she never lost or needed to reclaim, the catalyst is Amy wants to figure herself out more, so she can better protect the things she loves, not the least of which is Sonic. Don't mistake this either, this isn't just this game that nails Amy's execution. In a stark contrast to her portrayals in the West, these traits are consistent with Amy in Japanese. Writers are not afraid, or purposefully wish to shy away from showing the side of Amy in a positive light. When you compare that Japanese stream clip to the American one I showed off in Amy's original section, I think it's night and day who gets this character and who doesn't. This is an Amy made by people who love who she is, who understand her, not those who wish to transform her into someone else. So to summarize, I think what Frontiers executes here is wonderful and does a much better service to Amy's character as well as fixing the Pontac era issues with how she was handled in a similar way to the others. And speaking of those others though, let's go to Knuckles. The biggest change is that his arc largely addresses the one criticism I had with the English script, but unlike Amy's handling, I don't entirely prefer it. Knuckles' conclusion in Japanese is also that he can't dwell on the past, but instead of wanting to get out into the world and adventure like his friends, make new discoveries, it's to focus that exploration on where he came from, learn more about his people, with a feeling that he owes it both to himself and the Master Emerald, his final duty, his connection to the Echidnas, that he has at times neglected. I like that this puts an importance on the Echidna tribe, still referencing how flippant the games have been in the handling of his original purpose. It makes sense that such a similar civilization would bring these feelings to the forefront. And ignoring a certain game that should not be named, we have rarely gotten any plot or lore in relation to them since Adventure. Further, it feels like a more natural follow-up to the Knuckles animation that led into Frontiers, as he was already ruminating on his past and ancestry. In saying that though, the reason I don't outright prefer this version is because of what I did like in Ian's script, with Knuckles not being shackled to the past. In the end, both versions focus on the opposite areas of the character, where I think the perfect arc for him involves a fusing of these two scenarios, not neglecting his past and purpose, but also finding himself. 
All those pieces exist in both, they just lean one way or the other. And I can only hope going forward, the next game fully considers both aspects. Rounding out Sonic's friends, we have Tails. His characterization is certainly different, but not in a way that makes me feel particularly strongly. This change is subtle, and maybe that brings into question why I'd include it other than to round out the friends, but it's more so because I do find its subtlety interesting. Tails' arc addresses his current inconsistencies in the same manner as the English script. However, Tails puts this directly on himself running the chase after Sonic's example, ultimately failing and slipping back into cowardice because he can't be Sonic. He needs to find his own style, his own way of tackling things. He doesn't need to just be like Sonic to be on Sonic's level. Which as you'll recall, this is a very similar conclusion to the one I came to in my understanding and hopes going forward with the Tails scene prior. The Japanese version is simply more direct in where it wants to take Tails. Up to now, most of these arcs are fairly similar, and as we turn to Sage, it's not that she takes a huge departure from Flynn's version, but there is quite the significant difference. As in Kishimoto's version, she does not start with complete sentience. She's an AI through and through. But in watching Sonic, the freedom he has, the ideals, the determination to save his friends, she begins to question her code. In fact, she begins to question her entire existence. What are these strange impulses running through her? Is it okay to feel these things? Can she make choices for herself instead of following orders? Sage becomes a living being because of Sonic. And you know what? Conceptually, I think this simple tweak makes a better story. Overall, this puts a greater focus on what I love about Sonic, that he's this magical being that can better not only the people around him, but the entire world, simply by being who he is. On the topic, I also largely prefer Sonic's Japanese portrayal. Like most things, it's not even that different, but it boils down to how these small subtleties add up. And frankly, it's always a treat hearing Junichi Kanemaru. The voice issues I talked about in the English script could not be further removed from the Japanese version. So all in all, if I were to summarize my feelings here, while there are times where the Japanese script shows its faults with a cutscene not fitting perfectly or what have you, I think where it succeeds is in the characterization, with it making small tweaks to improve what was already working, while stripping away a lot of the fluff you will find in the English interactions. Finally some good goddamn music. A bit meta, but when I make videos on specific games, I do my best to capture the essence of that game. I do a lot to achieve this from graphics, sound effects, and most simply, only using music from that entry. And for this one, it was a doozy picking tracks. Because this game goes above and beyond in this aspect to break Sonic tradition, and deliver an awful OST. Which I know the immediate counter to this is the boss tracks. But this game has over a hundred musical pieces. You can't save it overall because five tracks or so are, yeah, fantastic on their own. The vast majority, however, are this weird blend of techno EDM lo-fi beats to hold the boost button to, or wind chimes blowing in the breeze whenever you're in the open zones. It sucks. And to be fair, this started with forces. But I am baffled by Sonic Frontiers' choice to continue this. This is not what I want out of Sonic music. No matter how far these games fell, their OSTs were always upheld in high regard. Even whenever the Sonic was never good crowd reared their dysfunctional heads, they wouldn't dare criticize this area of the games. I miss the electric guitars, the rock, the high energy, and this is such a hard thing to contend against because even the people who defend this OST go to the boss fights as the, hey, how can you say that man when this exists? where guess what genre those tracks are, proving my point. So it was vilifying to have the jukebox update, as it seemed almost like an acknowledgement to the issue, since it wasn't a sound test to just play any song in the game anywhere if you liked that track. It knew what would get people excited, and that was pulling from the music of past games. Now that was update 1, however, the second would be what I consider the best of the three, though it's not without its faults. 
it added the momentum options and challenges to unlock the spin dash. Now these challenges are pretty weak on their own if I'm honest. They require you to get a high score in certain areas of the islands. What this means in practice is you will run from one mini boss to the next, or fling yourself off a ramp to do a bunch of tricks. Some of these I found myself outright frustrated with, but I think it was largely because I just wanted to play with the spin dash instead of spending an hour again fighting these mini bosses I do not care for, or spinning my control stick. I much rather have had the spin dash being unlockable for completing the story, as you do need to get through every island to do all of these challenges anyway. But regardless of the manner in which you acquire it, the question becomes, is it a good reward? And the answer to this is, yeah, I think so. There are some issues. In fact, both the positives and the negatives are identical to my initial criticisms of slapping on momentum. Traversing the open zone becomes exciting. You can do a slew of new tricks as long as you have the smallest of inclines to spin dash off of, allowing you to reach anywhere you want to go in new ways. Conversely, similar to momentum, this breaks every stage in the game. You can sling yourself over the entirety or half the entirety of a level at the press of a button. But the main difference when compared to Momentum is you beat the game to earn this. Theoretically, you've done every challenge normally. It's a fun thing to mess around with in that, once again, tech demo sort of way. Although, it does dive into a greater negative with both these updates and the design philosophy for this game as a whole. But to truly get into this, we're going to have to talk about the last update, the Final Horizon. And this isn't going to be an easy one. Hold it, Hedgehog! Before you embark, there is one other scenario to consider. All right. I'm listening. The Final Horizon had many waiting in anticipation, as it promised something that a lot of fans have been yearning for, the return of Sonic's friends as playable characters, and an update to the final leg of the story. Because as mentioned, a lot of people seem to be disappointed with the initial execution of the ending, and even as someone who wasn't one of them, for the most part. I obviously saw gaping holes in how this game was rushed, so just as other fans did, I had high hopes for the Final Horizon, that it would fix and touch up many flaws as well as the cut corners I saw in the closing hours of the game. Which as unfortunate as it is to say, that is nothing like what the Final Horizon was. It's not that I had my expectations soaring in the skies or anything either. With Frontiers, I saw breadcrumbs, glimmers of hope, glances of where I want this series to go and return to. Being an update primarily focused on what was already here made me believe this would take those elements and build on them. Make them shine brighter while touching up the cracks in the foundation, but perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the friends. Most people would tell you Knuckles is the worst, but my cards are on Amy. My problems start at the conceptual phase. I don't think most on this side of the globe know this, but Amy's interest in tarot cards were meant to portray that she was an average girl, as tarot cards are a pretty normal hobby and interest of young Japanese girls, at least at the time of conception for the character. Making it that Amy has mystical powers is a complete misunderstanding of their purpose, to the point of where it becomes the complete opposite of the original intention. Like most problems related to Amy, this issue has been cropping up ever since the American side got a stronger hold on the franchise, with this almost fetishistic obsession with making it a bigger part of Amy's personality, to the point of it overriding other aspects of her, this game being the biggest culprit, as these cards replace her iconic Pico Pico Hammer, where multiple moves that once relied on it are now substituted for tarot cards. And it's not that you need to know these background design details to be upset by this. A lot of fans were disappointed because put simply, as I just said, the hammer is iconic, and wanting to play as a character entails their moves, their iconography. Seriously, imagine if they gave Knuckles a moveset based around Chuck and Grapes because someone on the team randomly remembered, oh, he likes those. When altering a core trait of a character, whether it's part of their design or personality, it's important to stay true to said character. Meanwhile, this is a complete betrayal for the addition of an unnecessary plot device. 
Amy being a normal girl played into that Girl Scout-like personality we've gone over. There's a charm to a normal person seeking and seeing the good in the world and all of its people, where once you start stripping away those core aspects that make Amy an average person, you make the character weaker as a result. But it does go further, as Ian Flynn really couldn't help himself with the script this time. There's a few lines that downplay the nature of Amy's affection. However, by far the biggest blunder here is this conversation. I'm not just a damsel in distress anymore. Just you watch. Eventually, you'll be the one relying on me for help. Amy Rose has never simply been a damsel in distress, and the times she has. Is it really such a bad thing? I know modern culture has attempted to gaslight everyone into thinking this is a dirty term, but I'm sorry, sometimes people need help. Tails, Knuckles, even Sonic have been in situations where they need to be saved or helped by others. There's nothing wrong with that. Further, since Amy's second inclusion in the games, she has been an active participant in events, oftentimes as someone in combat. But even when she wasn't, like with Adventure 2, you know, the game where she saves Sonic, where without her, they would have lost the final battle, as she reminded Shadow that he promised to fight for the world. In these scenarios, Amy is still a contributing factor in the group's success. Someone doesn't need to be physically strong to be a strong person, but Amy is both. The Japanese script handled this concept way better, as it's not that Amy hasn't caused issues for Sonic. She can seek to better herself like other characters, but it's within the vastly different execution that the problem lays. I don't know where Western writers get off with their obsession with taking old franchises, whether they be of Japanese or any other nation's origin, including the states, and writing these once nuanced female characters as strictly, hey, I'm one of the boys, I can beat people up too now. Just you wait. I'll get the next one. <laughs> Tell me where one is. I want to smash something too. And thinking they're God's gift to the fans for fixing these characters. I hate this Amy Rose. I hate the writing, the voice acting. Uh, well, too bad. They need me. I won't give up. I genuinely am some combination of mad or upset about everything to do with this character when she's touched by this side of the globe and I am doing everything in my power to hold back from talking about the panties, so let's talk about Knuckles. Oh boy. So this is true of all the friends, but it is most pertinent to Knuckles. They've chosen to design their kits with very little combat potential. Not only do you have to grind each of them individually up to their max attack, defense, and all those other stats, but you can't use them on anything. The DLC area bosses are a supercharged variant of all those on the initial islands, yet each of the friends are given a two-hit combo to deal with them, as the majority of their abilities are traversal or puzzle-based. So it's fairly obvious that combat is meant for Sonic still, making it very hard for me to wrap my brain around why these stats aren't just tied to him, or at least simply shared between the friends. It's just more tedium to grind this up with no payoff. But this is still Knuckles' section, supposedly, and unfortunately, his traversal doesn't fare much better. The gliding on offer is perhaps the stiffest the games have ever given us, where you're hardly able to adjust once your direction is set. And further, as many pointed out, Knuckles does this weird flip thing whenever going into a glide. Actually, so does Tails. Amy's not even missing out because they gave this unnecessary startup to her stupid witch move. Did I mention how much I <laughs> I'm sorry, we're done with Amy were on Knuckles. I know this little flip seems like a nitpick, but I want to bring attention to it because before Update 3 dropped, in the files for Update 2, the friend's movesets were all present already, and Knuckles' glide worked entirely different. It functioned how it did in the older games, where you could go directly into it after your jumps were used. And not only does this make the moveset flow much better, it even controlled better. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Much like the glide, Knuckles climbing has seen better days. The movement itself is not only slippery, making it far more unwieldy than past iterations, but it's now locked to only specific services that are color-coded. Knuckles used to be the character one would associate with exploration and traversal, yet somehow in this update, he's the character with by far the least ability to do so, with the exception of exploiting the game as now returns the iconic infinite hike glitch. You guys meant you wanted 
Boom Knuckles when you said you wanted him back, right? Actually, that little comment goes further. Throughout this DLC, the story dialogue related to Knuckles insistently has him talking about wanting to punch things. This is your arena, kid. I just wish I had something else to punch while I'm waiting. Listen, I know we've had multiple sections about these characters' personalities already, so I'm not going into why this is an issue. You can infer how that's not who Knuckles is at this point on your own. But it's just baffling that this DLC manages to execute so poorly on each of these characters. Their portrayal is identical to the Pontiac era that this game is supposedly saving us from. And I did mean all characters, as Tails sinks back right into his Sonic help me shtick canonically, I don't know, 10 minutes after the end of his arc. You know the thing that, in the base game, established we were moving past this. Again, not saying I never want him to show fear, but really, this. Immediately. You know there was a perfect chance to follow up his arc with Tails taking a leader role here. But they once again slotted that on Amy for some reason because she's strong and independent and all that crap. Truthfully, it seems like they'll give this position to anyone but the character that should take it, given it was Knuckles before, but no, the brilliant mind Tails is just gonna cower in the corner so we can cheer when he says he's done doing it for the fifth time. Actually, how about this? We, as in everyone, frequently compare Sonic to Dragon Ball. <laughs> it's not unwarranted. But you know who Tails is? He's Gohan. He's the guy who had one really good moment decades ago, but the writers have no idea what to do with him, so they just keep repeating the moment over and over and over, in the hopes that we will clap like seals just like the first time. But I'm not clapping. I gave you the base game. I took that as an acknowledgement of the past 10 years of writing being done, and we're finally getting back on track. But that was just Ian copying the damn cliff notes from the adventure games like he does best. Eggman, have you forgotten about what happened at Station Square? Did I mention Tails' stupid little wrench throw? As lifeless and ill-fitted of the character as everything else about him. Amy gets her hammer replaced. Tails can't spin his tails. Amazing. Seeing the cyclone was cool, I'll give you that. It does an amazing job at exemplifying the pop-in issues that have only gotten worse. Oh wait. We didn't talk about that, did we? Most games with updates fix these performance issues, but not Sonic Frontiers. In the final update, entire worlds come into view and disappear with the tap of a joystick. There were so many times I would have no clear idea how to get to an area beyond its waypoint, because the challenge I needed to beat wasn't visible. Good thing each character can break the game so easily so I can just fly over everything and land at the marker. What do I do? Why is it telling me to kill myself? Sonic Frontiers showed up and was like, go drown. You don't like what you're playing? Fine. End it. <laughs> like... <laughs> fly over there? Is it the poppin'? Oh my god! <laughs> Come on! That's on PC, by the way. May God help you if you're on a Switch. We're still missing someone, though. Sonic. While the friends are glitching their way to the emeralds, Sonic in this version of the story is tasked with climbing towers, much like the previous island. But to get there, he must first find these new breeds of Coco. It's fairly simple. You can find all you need by side looping around if you wish, or do a few new stages added to this update. And I was originally feeling a bit more positive toward these, as they are original stages designed around the game, though reusing pieces of level design from the base game. So I guess that whole new level thing is only sometimes true. But in opposition to those other few original stages in the base game, this time the levels are focused on the momentum options added in post-release updates, which sounds promising. However, what you will quickly realize is all of these stages are designed in a particular way. You find a ramp, you spin dash to shoot yourself over half a level, and proceed to do it again. This can be fun, but it's shallow. You aren't really platforming or doing all that much other than aiming Sonic. Its gameplay loop feels closer to the mobile game Angry Birds than a legitimate Sonic game. I know our response to this might be bringing up how in older games, the spin dash can be used for crazy skips, but that requires level knowledge, execution, positioning, and it still doesn't skip over levels to the extent of just looking in a direction at random and pressing a button. You might say, well, just don't use the spin dash like was brought up before. 
actually play the level. It's your choice. But these are genuinely designed around doing it. There are platforms long off in the distance waiting with the next ramp to fling yourself off of. Getting a good rank requires you to send yourself over the level as opposed to playing through it. And while there is entertainment to be had here, as I wouldn't mind special stages like this honestly, you could just replace the robot tails with an emerald and boom, you're done. However, when it comes to actual levels, I want a platform in my 3D platformer. Not for the intended route to behold a button to skip over 60% of the level. Even the challenges that ask slightly more of you are completely made of blind jumps over bottomless pits. If you get to play them, that is. Because much like the rest of this update, Playtesting didn't seem worthwhile to the folks at Sonic Team, leading to many soft locks and restarts. My hope going forward since Sonic Team was saying they were going to stick with the open zone, was that instead of these Unity assets, we could have a game that is an open world station square, or something that resembled locations on South Island, a big open area that actually used the Sonic art style. Further. Maybe the team in working with recreating these adventure and unleash stages learned from them, where they could create brand new levels in those styles. And because they're new, more thought would go into making them work within the game's engine. The base game gave me a little hope in its final hour for the future, but that's all been dashed here. Usually DLC is a great way to see how developers improved post-release, with their engine, the game's criticism, and all those other factors. It's a look into future projects, but these stages make me feel anything but hopeful. It feels like all the wrong lessons were learned. A thought that might also be felt as you eventually gain access to these towers. As unlike the previous climbs, there's not only no checkpoints to rope you back up, but if you fail falling to the bottom of the tower, many of the things you need to climb up don't respawn. Walls don't respawn, so you have to jump on the wall. Ooh, 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 I... So you have to glitch or find other unintended routes to climb up it once more. Not to mention, what this game demands of you on top of that, I don't think it has tight enough controls to ask for, or good enough design. Specifically because depending on your settings for Sonic's controls, challenges can literally be impossible. This is not good design. Sonic Frontiers is a demonstration and how to not develop a game. It's near impossible to design challenges around players who have wildly different parameters. I found myself adjusting my game settings mid-climb for each tower depending on what's asked. Then there's the times when the game just screws you over through no fault of your own, because sometimes you can't even see the platforms. There's been many a coper trying to compare this to Eggman Land in Unleashed, and that is frankly insulting. Sure, Sonic does not control the best when type platforming is concerned with Unleashed. And the designers knew this. Not only is the damn game designed around it, but there's plenty of checkpoints and extra lives right before every challenge within Eggman Land. You complete the section, then you go on to the next. I praise the earlier towers for similar design. Both of these are all about testing you on the game's tools that you had been taught how to use throughout the adventure. Whereas a further defense of the Final Frontier's towers. It's often that there are complaints that the base game was too easy, so we shouldn't blame Sonic Team now. And to that I say, who? Who said that? It wasn't me, or any review I saw. Was it the Sonic Twitter base? Because that's who keeps telling me this was a thing. And really, if that's who all these changes were for in this content sludge of an update where things are just added without care for quality, it does really begin to make sense. This game's issue was never that it was easy. In fact, I heard more people complain that you had to play it on hard for the true ending, if anything. The issue with this game is tedium. Most things are mindless, and that's not synonymous with easy. Easy games can still be fun. For example, it's not that I brought up breath to say the game's harder than Frontiers, so therefore it's good. The challenges are mostly easy in that game. You just actually have to think of solutions, where multiple could work and that process is enjoyable because of its design and mechanics. You know what? Ignore Zelda. Let's stick to Sonic. These games have never been designed to strictly be difficult for the player. Since the Genesis era, what happens when you mess up in platforming? You fall to the lower level and take a slower route. You don't die or even have to do a section again. You can succeed even at a low skill level. The ring system itself plays into this. You can get hit as many times as you want, as long as you grab a singular ring after. Thus, you're able to trivialize most challenges in these games, with few exceptions. However, you are rewarded for playing well. 
whether it's keeping speed to finish a level quickly with style, simply getting a good rank, or so many other scenarios. Sonic has always been a series that is easy to succeed in, but difficult to master, and that's what makes it fun to keep getting better at them. It's not about the accomplishment, it's about the style in doing it. In fact, games that are punishing in that exact design philosophy, like Dimps Made Sonic games, are criticized for it due to their bottomless pit base levels. And I would say something like the towers are even worse. Dimps had the decency to kill you, instead of asking you to go through a section of the level that is now broken. All of this is not to say designing your own difficulty is bad of course. It's about actually creating intuitive design that allows the player to overcome the obstacles and not feel cheated. The player should clearly be at fault for their failures, not poor communication of design. Which brings me to what awaits atop these towers. Once Sonic reaches the Coco at the top, he will be given a test, which are wildly inconsistent in terms of both their execution and difficulty. The enemies, much like the rest of the DLC, are powered up versions, here having higher health pools in combination with simply speeding up their animations to an absurd degree, which in turn makes them feel like enemy designs you'd see in a fan mod, a consistent theme of this game. This is the laziest way you can go about approaching a higher difficulty, not actually improving the AI, the moves, or anything, to make the encounters more demanding in a thoughtful manner. Just turn up the numbers and make them damage sponges. I'm unsure how much they were even tested, honestly, as a difficulty curve feels odd. The second and last challenges are by far harder than anything that comes in between. With Tower 2, the enemies are constantly invincible, giving you very little time to attack, and even less time to work with, while all other challenges with that one exception feel almost insulting in comparison with both of what they ask of you and the time you're allotted. To me it's very obvious that Tower 2 has enemies that's designed directly clash with the parameters set by this DLC leading to a frustrating experience, whereas the developers didn't think or maybe have the time to adjust this challenge as much as it needed to be. And similarly, the final challenge suffers from this to an even greater extent. Here we have Sonic having to fight all the previous island bosses in a gauntlet, except with nerf stats, inability to grab rings beyond the 400 it gives you, or the ability to parry without perfect timing. And this really demonstrates how poorly readable these fights are. This isn't a problem in the main game, as the parry is designed to be held as long as you please. It's not asking for tight execution, thus it doesn't have to perfectly communicate when these attacks are landing, which it doesn't. When you have a split second to do this, that's a different story. Bosses wind up their attacks and the hitboxes seem to come at random, or maybe they don't wind up at all. Regardless, it results in the player getting punished when they really don't have enough information to react. You can learn this timing simply by experience and memorization, but this isn't good design. These fights weren't made for these mechanics in mind, and don't even get me started on the lead up to the wyvern fight. I honestly do wish this game had an actual parry with timing, but part of that is designing the game with that in mind, not just slapping it in. Night was the only time you were asked to do something timing based, and it gave you so much information with the red line that came out of the shield, showing you the path allowing the player to plan your move. Meanwhile here, it's like they added it to these fights without testing if it was actually intuitive or adjusting it to be so. In fact, that's the problem with Sonic Frontiers. The DLC exemplifies it, but this was true of the base game. They ripped levels and assets from past entries without considering how they would function in this engine. Then they added momentum on top of that without considering how they designed the entire game. Then the spin dash and the handling of the friends. With every new piece of content they add, they don't ask if it actually benefits what came before. Instead of focusing their efforts improving the things that work and adding to that, they just add more stuff. It feels like it's the reason they chose open world as a genre to begin with. It's quantity over quality. And listen. There are things I like in this game, cool stuff, ideas of all manner, that I have been wanting from the series, even within the DLC. I think Super Sonic 2 is awesome. Hell, I love that it's called Super Sonic 2 in the files. The animations in Supreme's second phase now are sick. The cyber form we get for like 30 seconds is the coolest shit in the world. It's dark Super Sonic tier. But this fight, man. Super Sonic 2 is just an objectively worse version of Super Sonic mechanically since he uses a perfect parry as opposed to the infinite one, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world 
if it wasn't for the fact that the camera constantly obscures your vision. So you can't see shit because the trees cover half the screen, while the game simultaneously demands you perfect parry projectiles. I know we just talked about how important visual clarity is, but this is on another level. This is just unacceptable. Yet it's not the only example of poor clarity in this fight. Let me tell you my experience. Fighting both the camera and Supreme, I begin giving him the hands, when I then notice he is healing. So I back off, because naturally I assume the healing is telling the player that attacking him directly isn't the solution. Therefore I begin circling around him, proceeding to then get super close, anything, to try and switch my reticle to his arms, the tentacles, or the plug, as these to me stick out as the main possibilities. However, none of these maneuvers work, so I give up attempting to psi loop him multiple times because, you know, when in doubt do a psi loop, though this still didn't work. Now as it turns out, I wasn't wrong. You can attack the tentacle, but unlike any other example in the game, when changing your target is needed, it isn't simply about moving your position. You have to first attack Supreme, then dodge to the left, and you will begin attacking the tentacle. This has never been a mechanic the game demands you to engage with, which is why you can find threads upon threads of people thinking the game was glitched. Unable to beat the boss not because of a lack of skill or even intuition, but a lack of communication. Yet anytime anyone brings attention to the poor clarity of this interaction, a Sonic fan on Twitter pulls themselves out of their slop-filled bow of mediocrity to say how it's totally the player's fault, and it was obvious. Because I don't know, two years ago the game told you you can dodge behind the sex-shaped ninja enemy when they block, even though that's not necessary. You can counter it, dodge normally, and then attack, or a host of other options at the player's disposal. So it's never something you learn to intuitively use in fights or even think about. On top of that not even being the same situation, but okay. Upon this discovery, I went back through the game myself, again, keeping this tool in mind. And there is one other interaction it creates beyond the two mentioned, and me and my friend had our minds blown by this, as it gets you behind Night's shield. However, that facilitates the point. You never needed to do this. The game doesn't teach you to consider this maneuver, and frankly, it'd be perfectly fine if it's simply an option you can discover in niche situations, like those other instances. But if you're going to require it of the player, you need to either indicate that to them or teach them. So no, I don't believe it's the player's fault if they don't understand. And because I've seen this argument so much, I want to reiterate that people struggling isn't the inherent issue. I love hard games, but it's not because I'm always good at them, though that's not to say I'm always bad at them either. It depends, and that's the crux of it. For me, it's the adrenaline, the excitement of it. I love being challenged. It doesn't matter if I can instantly claim victory making that other guy mine, or get kicked into the damn concrete before getting there. But a stipulation of that is that I am actually being challenged. The game is not obscuring mechanics from me. It teaches me, or at least gives me an understanding, of the tools. Now, players aren't perfect. Sometimes they miss something that is clearly conveyed, and that's on them. But when looking at a game, I judge it on its own merits. Was this intuitive? Is this player given the proper information? And it's not easy being the teacher. I've been there. A lot goes into well-made hard games, making sure their encounters are designed well enough to lead a player into how to overcome them. Supreme 2, though, has none of that. I can boot the game up right now and beat it easily, but it's not because I learned the fight, mastered the mechanics, observed the patterns. I just know the one simple trick that the end hates. Supreme 2 feels like it's on a first pass from a design standpoint. It's not an inherently difficult fight. Whether it's the camera being glued to taking scenic shots so you can't see any of the incoming attacks you're supposed to perfect parry, or the general poor communication on what to do. And you know what? That's still not the worst part of this package. No. As I said, DLC 3 exemplifies every flaw in Sonic Frontiers, just as it dug into the past to retcon aspects of the adventure game's narratives, making some elements worse. Not even its own story is safe from this. Sonic Frontiers once again doesn't think to improve what worked, instead choosing to just throw on more stuff. Sage's narrative was the one thing that really connected for me here. At points in this video I've even called this game her story, yet she's pretty much removed from it now. From Eggman and Sage's closing thoughts to each other, to the way she sacrificed herself, and what it meant for Eggman at the end. 
Hell, the fact that you played as her and the emotional weight that fight held. With the end speech implied. The goddamn closing song. It's all retconned. The beauty of that lead up and finale is just non-existent now, as far as the story is concerned. The original genuinely had me leaving my experience with Sonic Frontiers both positive and hopeful. It wasn't perfect mind you, but the final act needed polish, not an entire rewrite. It's not as if I don't like some elements from the new ending either, I just wish they actually found a way to make it work with what they had. But that is never the thought with this game. You can't tell me they couldn't. Even Kingdom Hearts 3 did it, for as much shit as I'll give that game. Remind improved a lot on both gameplay and the game's ending, while having the exact same structure as the Final Horizon. <laughs> I just, I can't get over it. I've never experienced DLC for a single player game and felt the entire product, from the gameplay to the story, was permanently made worse as a result. In the wake of all of this, I keep being told people with passion worked on this game, so I can't criticize it. Oh, this update was free. I'm so ungrateful that Kishimoto, Flynn, and the entire team are trying. So let me tell you something that will blow your mind. Firstly, every piece of media has people passionate working on it. Secondly, Kishimoto directed Sonic Forces and Lost World, two games also heavily criticized by these same people for apparently not trying. But we all know what this is. They don't believe this statement, as they are willing to criticize those games. It's just thrown out in an attempt to stop others when they criticize something that person likes. But honestly, that doesn't matter. I don't care how much passion went into this. Frontiers might be the most I've ever been disappointed by a Sonic game, especially if DLC 3 is a glimpse into our future. And I don't say that lightly. I never made that claim during the Pontac era. I never made a video on Forces or Lost World, or any of the other games, because the key word is disappointed. This isn't the worst Sonic game narratively, or the worst in the gameplay department, but part of it is the expectation set. And another is that I can't wave off my dissatisfaction like the last few years of Sonic by going, oh, this isn't the Sonic I care about. It's all completely disconnected. Not anymore. In this case, you are deliberately saying and trying to invoke these characters, poorly mind you, as well as the time period, the lore, just about everything else surrounding it. You won't shut up about the fact that this is what you're trying to emulate. Have you forgotten about what happened at Station Square? <sighs> I can't tell you how much I regret even suggesting the idea that Flynn write for these games years ago. And that's not just because of this game. But, you know, there is one thing that is a constant within both of these time periods. With almost every Sonic Team game that has released since Colors, a certain phrase has followed it. That Sonic is taking steps in the right direction. He's getting back on track. It's written on so much positive coverage of Frontiers and now Superstars as well. And you know, this isn't me saying these phrases are never earned. I have like certain aspects of Sonic Team games over the past decade. Hell, the sentiment was probably true for a time when generations followed up colors, before this drip feed of meteorocrity. However, those games are over 10 years old now. It's true of Frontiers as well though, even with it being the culinary equivalent of Kishimoto putting a raw steak on my plate while Flynn shakes a picture of the one Shiro Makiawa made decades ago. I still took a liking to some things, even if it was simply the ingredients at times. However, that's such a low standard at this point, isn't it? It's never just good, great, awesome, outstanding, amazing. It's the, well, you know, maybe if the next one keeps going on this path, it'll really knock it out of the park for Sonic Team. But Sonic has been going in the right direction for so many years now, yet he never seems to make it to the destination. Well, thanks for watching. This was a fairly long project with an even longer journey to see it through. It's almost quaint looking back at that positivity I shared in the opening paragraphs. Perhaps that's why I've decided not to rewrite them. I wanted you to take this journey with me and see I really did want to come out of it positively. But now that's over, I'd like to thank the people on screen, whether they be patrons or YouTube members, as their support affords me the time to work on these things. And if you want to help the channel in a similar manner, or by simply leaving a like or a comment, it all goes a long way. So, another thank you to any who choose to do that. Till next time.